Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode 450 of the podcast and uh, I'm recording this early, it's Wednesday 11th of September 2019 as I record this as I'm off to Lisbon, Portugal tomorrow. So today I'm talking to the lovely James Scott Bell, one of the great teachers of writing, certainly one of the most prolific. We're talking today about the last 50 pages, the art and craft of unforgettable endings, and also some thoughts on what happens when a traditional publisher who owns the rights to your books goes bankrupt and your books move somewhere new and you didn't get any choice in the matter. This recently happened to James and I've heard many authors over the years talk about this situation happen. We've seen some pretty bad results in other situations. James is very happy with the result of what happened to him and he'll talk about that but it's really good to think about your books as intellectual property assets and I hope you've got that message over the many years I've been doing this. Um, Plus, uh, he also talks about how he makes his money right now as someone who believes in multiple streams of income. And he, very similar to me, does uh, fiction, nonfiction. He's got online courses. He does teaching. He does lots of things. So, um, and uh, I was... uh, We met in person for the first time when we were both up for, I think it was 2017, we were up for best um, ebook original Thriller Fest and he won and of course he absolutely deserved it and we had a good laugh together that night. So uh, Jim is a, I I guess I I hope I can call him a friend and uh, we have a good chat today. So I, I really think you'll enjoy that coming up. Not much happening in publishing news, marketing news uh, or futurist stuff. So just a quick intro, Um, a bit of an update in my personal situation on health. Lots of you have emailed and tweeted me with things around, uh, I mentioned last week, I was having a lot of shoulder pain. I have seen a specialist (laughs) and it was was quite shocking when I actually looked at how long... um, this pain has kind of come and gone over the years. And uh, of course, I've done as in the healthy writer, I talk about doing everything for RSI, um, posture, well, I say posture stuff, we'll come back to that in a minute. But I've done my um, workplace assessment, I do Swiss ball, stand, sit, I do a lot of exercise. Um, I've had all kinds of things over the years, I have not ignored my health. But it was funny, because uh, basically, he said, Yes, it's your posture. (laughs) So over 25 years, pretty much, of working at a computer, my shoulders have hunched forwards and hunched forwards. And now what's happening is the hunch is starting to press down on um, the nerves in my arms. So this is why this pain has moved from left side to right side over the years. And that's it's not about mouse clicking or any of that. It is about my posture. So I kind of feel a bit angry with myself because I should have seen a specialist a while ago. But no, I just went to, um, you know, physios and gym people and things. But the specialist kind of said, right, this is this is what you need to do. So interesting, because postural correction obviously takes a long time. And so I need to be very aware of this. Uh, If you've met me in person, you'll know I'm not like a a hunchback. I I don't feel like I'm overly hunched, but my shoulders have clearly been in the wrong position for a long time. (laughs) So why I wanted to share an update is one, thank you. Many of you were very kind and sent me lovely emails, but also... uh, just do not ignore the signals from your body. And this is something I am absolutely guilty of. In the last decade of building this business, I have prioritised my work. 
And The Healthy Writer was a great book to write with Dr. Ewan Lawson. And I, you know, I have these periods of really focusing, doing healthy things, but I still have not ignored the warning signals in my arms and in my shoulders and in my back. So, for example, um, you know, I will work a 12 hour day if I'm trying to get something finished. And a friend of mine said, but you, you run your own business. You don't have publishers giving you deadlines, but I'm so driven to my own deadlines. And also, for example, I book a proofreader in and I wanted to deliver the book on time to her I never miss a deadline like realistically I'm saying that right now I, I'm trying to think I mean I just don't miss deadlines even if they're self-imposed and maybe <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to be gentle with myself but I need to not ignore these signals. And so I would have been ignoring sort of tingling in my arm, just thinking, oh, you know, just another couple of hours of work and it'll be fine. And now I really am going to have to not ignore those signals from my body. So I wanted to, and the reason I'm sharing this health stuff is because I'm absolutely aware of how many writers have health problems. And I realise that you know, money can be difficult, but sometimes we can find out what to do on the internet. It doesn't have to be expensive specialists or whatever. But also, I'm really glad that I just spent that extra money on um, seeing someone who is a shoulder specialist. And now I can focus on doing the right things. And if I fix this now, I won't end up in chronic pain later touch wood. (laughs) But I definitely shocked myself um, because I do. I mean, I'm very active. You know, I I often walk, I walk, you know, my normal walk is sort of 10k and my longer walks are 20k or more. And I do yoga and I do, I go to the gym and I do all this stuff, but I've been doing it in the wrong posture. (laughs) I laugh at myself. I share this all with you, my friends, because... I hope it helps somebody listening. And if you've been ignoring the signals from your body, then this is a little heads up. We can all use a little body wisdom sometimes, can't we? So also going away for a few days uh, for book research in Lisbon. I'm very excited about that. Um, I've talked about how I find stories before, but essentially we're going because in Amsterdam, you know, I saw this Portuguese synagogue and now researching Lisbon, it's really interesting because when we go there, I've got a vague itinerary of the places I want to go. So for example, I want to go to the monastery, quite a famous monastery. Um, But I'm not going to the monastery with an idea to see anything specific. What I do when I go on these research trips is I will, I'll go to the museums, I'll walk around the streets, I'll look for stuff that I can use in a story that might also resonate with other places and might resonate with a story. So I have a vague idea of what I want to find, but I have immense trust that I will find something. And this is what I love about writing the type of books I write. The Arcane books in particular, this is my process for Arcane, is I find the story in my travels. And I don't Yeah, it's based on research and I make as much of it true as possible and then I just push it over into fiction. So yeah, very excited about that. Thanks to Sophia Ferros for her tips on Lisbon and um, also for kind of reminding me that the Portuguese Empire included places like Angola and, uh, you know, lots of, there's some very interesting places that speak Portuguese around the world. Um, So yeah. I am going to be looking at that. And of course, if you want to see any pictures, you can see them on Instagram at jfpenauthor. Right, useful stuff this week. I am very excited to tell you about the Teachable Summit. So if you don't know Teachable, they are what I and many others use for our online courses. And they do one of the best online summits out there. Now, I know there are tons of online summits, but this is a very good one. It is free. And it is for those of you who want to make a living online. So it's not specifically for authors. Um, It's more about developing courses, about podcasting, about online products. So if you are a 
non-fiction author wanting to turn your book into multiple streams of income, definitely, definitely worth attending. If you are a fiction author who would like to think about how you might develop other streams of income, then I also recommend it. So it's definitely for those people who want to make more money online, but not necessarily just from books. Um, So if you're just focusing on books, it's not for you. But if you want to go wider, definitely interesting. Now, this year, the summit includes people like Marie Folio, who is one of the most successful female entrepreneurs online. Um, Pat Flynn, who is probably one of the highest paid podcasters in the world. Um, Melissa Griffin, who I'm interested in listening to, who is known as the Pinterest superstar. And as I've mentioned before, I'm starting to use Pinterest for books and travel. It's going to be the social media that I use primarily for that new brand. So I'm definitely listening to that section. Also, Leslie Samuel from Become a Blogger. And Leslie learned about blogging from Yarrow Starak, who I've had on the show. And I know Leslie's done some great things with that brand about blogging. Um, So interesting too. Also, people like Carrie Green, who's a British female entrepreneur, and Chris Ducker, who's been on this show several times and is very inspiring. So you can learn uh, all about mindset, about creating, obviously, a profitable course, growing an email list, things to avoid, and Uh, lots of really interesting stuff. So go and check it out. It's free. You can find out more at thecreativepen.com forward slash summit 19, S-U-M-M-I-T-1-9, thecreativepen.com forward slash summit 19. So this is time limited. You can register right now. The event happens 24th to 26th of September 2019. So uh, definitely very time limited. Um, If you are listening after that date, (laughs) you can still check out Teachable at thecreativepen.com forward slash Teachable. Um, Those are obviously my affiliate links. I I use Teachable. I recommend it. I think it's fantastic. Uh, I used to do all my courses on my own site um, with, you know, it was a nightmare. So I love Teachable. (laughs) It just makes everything so easy. Plus, they deal with the European uh, digital VAT issues, um, for which I also love them. So yes, check out the summit, thecreativepen.com forward slash summit 19. Right, emails and tweets. Thank you so much for those this week. Obviously, the show only went out a couple of days ago, so there's just a a few. Um, Laurie, writer Laurie on Twitter says, I hear you on all the clicking to upload books. (laughs) Redid my covers and interiors of all four novels. I'm developing an allergy to click to continue. And so I had mentioned that it was the clicking and potentially the kind of overuse of my arm. But actually what it was was that I had spent too long at the keyboard with my shoulders hunched over and it kind of pressed down on my nerves. So it's not so, it's, this is what's so fascinating about our bodies, right? There are so many things we can do that um, that we might blame on something else, <laughs> which is classic. Uh, Monica T. Rodriguez, hi Monica, um, says this week's podcast is a perfect example of why I listen to the creative pen every week. I expected an episode on audio narration to have little that's relevant for me, but there was so much good information. So helpful. Very glad you found that useful. And I do hope I do that on my interviews. I obviously when I go into an interview, I have I always prepare questions. um, So the guest knows what I want to talk about. But I also say I might delve into other things. So I do hope that is what you get from these shows. I never stick to just my prepared questions. I always try and go further. Also, Emily Robertson says, um, awesome to hear the talk about audiobooks and performing our work. I needed to hear this today and I'll be recording myself reading the first chapter of Lifestyles of Gods and Monsters for Practice. That's a great title, Emily. Love it. I also just want to mention that I, I talked to someone this week who... Uh, kind of came to me quite late, you know, through my personal network. I don't do consulting anymore, <laughs> um, but, you know, it came to me through a, a network and um, I realised that many people who are self-publishing books still don't know what many of us know. So, and it quite shocked me because there's still people using systems and thought and thinking that things are the same as they were five years ago, 10 years ago. So I just wanted to encourage everyone. And I think I was just so stunned because I realised how much I know about 
publishing <laughs> at this point <laughs> and how little very many people do know. And so I wanted to just tell you all that probably by listening to this show and by learning about this stuff, you you do know a lot more than a lot of people. So understand that knowledge is power in this situation and choice. Knowledge is also choice. And I helped uh, this person with their book as much as I could. But the knowledge gap was so huge (laughs) that in the end, I said, please read my ebook, Successful Self-Publishing, and that is going to tell you a lot. Um, And of course, I updated that earlier this year. So it is up to date. Um, Yeah, so I just wanted to hopefully encourage you and say that you you probably know a lot more than you think about all of this stuff if you've been around the industry for a couple of years now. Right, so today's show is sponsored by Draft to Digital, and I'll play a word from the lovely Kevin Tomlinson in a minute. Now, Draft to Digital are doing some great Ask Me Anything sessions at the moment, and you can find replays at their blog. So, drafttodigital.com forward slash blog. They've also just announced more library distribution with Hoopla. Now, I love library distribution, and this has a pay per checkout model. This is one of the great reasons to use draft to digital um, and I just went in and you can with one click you can just put all of your books into Hoopla and I'm very passionate about indies getting into libraries which you can only do if you are wide with your ebooks and audiobooks obviously you can go into libraries with print but it's actually very hard because they have to order your book whereas with ebooks and audiobooks if you're in their catalogue then if someone requests your book they can get it in and it doesn't cost them much money now with traditional publishers changing their models around libraries, it is a very good time for indies to get into libraries. So check out draft to digital I still use them myself, I think they're fantastic. So, and I'll play a word from Kevin in a minute. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time in creating the show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. And of course, this week I just sent out the Q&A, a bit of a longer one. It's about uh, 50 minutes this this month um, talking about lots of stuff. Uh, Thanks to new patrons this week, Sarah K. McCashin, Marion, Darren Blake, Lisa Robertson and Patrick McLaughlin. So I really do appreciate your support on Patreon. Like the tweets and emails, it demonstrates you enjoy the show and find it useful and want it to continue. Uh, You can support the show for just a couple of dollars a month, less than a coffee a month, and you'll get that extra Q&A audio, including the backlist. You can support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, here's a word from Kevin from Draft Digital, and then we'll get on to the interview. Hi, this is Kevin Tomlinson with Draft Digital, bringing you the DDD Smart Author Tip number seven. Did you know that DDD can get your books into Amazon? How about Walmart.com? Apple, Kobo, Barnes & Noble. Man, we reach a lot of retailers worldwide. If you've been wondering about how to get your ebook into a particular retailer's storefront, there's a really, really good chance we can help with that. In fact, that's kind of our thing. Make publishing so easy, all you have to do is write your book. We'll take care of the rest. Start reaching a bigger audience now. Convert your manuscript, distribute it online, and get support the whole way at drafttodigital.com slash pen. Sign up now and get a free author marketing guide, drafttodigital.com slash pen. Happy writing. James Scott Bell is the best-selling and award-winning author of thrillers, historical fiction, and many excellent books on the craft of writing. He's a professional speaker, teaching novel writing and other skills for writers. His latest book for authors is The Last 50 Pages, The Art and Craft of Unforgettable Endings. Welcome back, Jim. Always good to be here. Thank you. (laughs) And it's your fourth time on the show, so you're definitely up there with our top guests. We're always requested. I I am honoured, yes. (laughs) Fantastic. Oh, well, look, we've got lots to talk about, but let's start off with the endings, um, the craft topic. So let's uh, get right into it. Why are endings so important for authors? Well, I think we've all, I know we've all had the experience of 
seeing a movie or reading a book or a TV series that we're really enjoying, and then the ending comes and is a complete disappointment, and that just wipes, seems to wipe out all of the previous pleasure, even though you may have been caught up into it. Um, and I like the uh, saying that Mickey Spillane, the famous uh, pulp writer, said the, that the first chapter sells your book, the last chapter sells your next book. And that's really key because if you're, if you're not giving the readers the full satisfactory experience, then you're not prompting them to say, hey, I want to read the next one or find something else by the same author. So obviously it's important that way. Um, when I was trying cases, when I was, I was a trial lawyer for several years, I, uh, we talked about what's called primacy and recency, meaning that the jury tends to remember most what they hear first and what they hear last with special emphasis on the last. The, the closing argument, that's where you close the sale and you try to get the verdict. And it's the same way with a, a book that you are giving an entertainment value and you want at the end to that value to be increased and not decreased. So yeah, obviously it's, it's crucially important. There's a lot of books out there about openings, about how to hook a reader and the first page, the first five pages uh, is, a, is a book that's out there. And I looked around and I didn't see anything on endings. If, if maybe there's something out there, I wasn't able to, to find it. A book about dealing with how to make a satisfactory ending. And so that's why I wrote it. Mm. And it is, it's a great book. And, and I, I'm, I think, you know, you and I both write thrillers. And uh, in fact, I should mention, we were both up for a thriller award a couple of years ago, which you won. <laughs> Me, no. the, the best man won. Absolutely. <laughs> That was that was absolutely fun to be with you there. It was. Um, but what we should say with endings, I think, again, with thrillers, I've read so many thrillers, like thousands over the years, and I definitely need a good ending. Like, I feel like if I don't get a good ending, I, I'm disappointed with the whole book, you know, if I get that far. Right. And although I love Stephen King, and we're not going to do any spoilers, people, so don't worry, but Stephen King's Under the Dome is probably my the worst ending I think of a book I really enjoyed the book it's super long and um the ending of the book I don't know about the tv series but w was pretty bad and I'm not going to say what it is but I feel like partially it was a genre problem so mm. what what is the uh thing about reader satisfaction within a genre for an ending yeah well, I do think readers read genres for specific purposes they want <clears throat> they they want a certain experience. I once hear, heard uh, Lee Child talk about his preference for Dom Perignon. You know, he loves Dom Perignon champagne. And when he opens a bottle and he has a glass, he doesn't want it to taste like pink lemonade. He doesn't want a different, he wants Dom Perignon. And that's the way he writes his books is that he wants to give the readers the experience that they have come to expect and, and to love. And, so there are genre expectations. Now, if you if you know what they are and you have a purposeful reason for turning them on their head or doing something different, then that's fine as long as you know what you're doing. Now, I wrote a historical novel called Glimpses of Paradise, which is a big historical romance. And I did something at the end which some of my romance writer friends said I shouldn't do, but I felt this is the right ending for this book. And it wasn't a pure romance. It was historical as well. So uh, I took that, that chance and the book did very well and was up for an award and so on. But I, I knew what I was doing and that's the key. Know what you're doing, know what the readers want. And usually you give that to them. The key is to give it to them in an original way. And that's one of the keys to an unforgettable ending. Mm. Oh, and it's funny you mentioned Lee Child, and of course Lee would drink Dom Perignon. <laughs> I mean, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, but it's uh, it is interesting because I feel like, uh, and let's take romance for example. You know, you'll see H E A or happily happy ever after in people's blurbs, so you know what the ending is. So if, it, it's not surprising because you know what's going to happen. Or in a um, crime novel, uh, you expect the death of the villain or the criminal brought to justice and. And if that doesn't happen, you're kind of upset about that. But as you say, there has to be something that's 
surprising but also inevitable right that's exactly right it's well well put the the ending has to seem inevitable but also in a in a surprising way in a way that the reader isn't predicting be, be, you know the the method because predictability is what makes for for boring so yeah that's that's really what the key is. and i think one of the secrets to doing that is to make sure that you have an inner journey, a character journey, as well as a plot journey. Um, something that is transforming in the character. Uh, I wrote a book called write your novel from the middle, which is, uh, all about that is it's about that. What the book is really about is this character transformation, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean I'm, uh, I'm not saying that the plot isn't important because I'm a plot guy. The plot is crucially important, but you elevate it by having a character go through a transformation process or a process where they're becoming stronger because of what they're going through. And that's always the, the fodder for the most interesting part of a book or the most original part is, you know, the, the human condition is so infinite that we have a lot of room to play with it there. And uh, that's one of the things I think a key to say a series like uh, the Harry Bosch books by Michael Connolly is the the inner turmoil and growth and drive and obsession of the character carries through the series and you see harry's uh, struggles and growth and you know reaching certain levels and then falling back you see that within the parameters of each book which are you know self-contained cases yeah and and that becomes a question about series um that i think people do get confused with uh, is how do you have a satisfying ending in each book, but still hook people to another book? Is is it just character uh, that people want to come back to a character in a series, or are, are there any other tips for um, an ending? I feel like you can open too many loops and annoy people if you don't yes. close some of them. Yeah, that's true. I, I I think in the you know as a general rule, if you're Unless you're writing a true, say, trilogy, like The Hunger Games, for example, where, where you have uh, a, an arc about the, the meta narrative, which is about, you know, Pan Am, the, the whole um, oppressive government thing and the uprising and so forth that is, isn't solved until the end of the third book. But within each of those books, there's something that is solved. A plot, for instance, in the first one, you know, she survives The Hunger Games. It would have been terrible if you got to the end of that book and you still didn't know what the outcome of the Hunger Games was going mm, to be. Yeah. So that's what you're saying is so. Um, but if you're writing a series character, let's say, then obviously one of the keys is the character themselves. I mean, what what makes them interesting? What makes why do we want to keep reading about this particular character? Um, you've got to do all the character work to make that particular character worth following. And then you do something like a, what uh, Michael Connolly does. And uh, another writer who, who did something similar is uh, Lawrence Block, who's a grandmaster crime writer, uh, had a series about uh, an investigator named Matthew Scudder. And the first couple of his books were really sort of plot heavy and kind of uh, by the numbers, uh, procedurals. And then he wrote a book called Eight Million Ways to Die, in which he took it up a, up a level and was dealing with not just the, the case that Scudder was on, but the milieu, which was late 70s New York, which was um, you know a lot different than it is today, and um, also alcoholism. Now, the alcoholic ex-cop is kind of a cliche now, but when uh, Lawrence Block was doing it, it was new and he really delved into that aspect of the character. So the books after that all dealt with that personal inner aspect of of the character. So but and yet each book has a case that was solved in, within the um, in the confines of that particular plot. But then you have the character ongoing and you want to know what's what's happening. Now, there, there's there's one little addition to that. I call it the uh-oh ending, where you do solve the plot, 
But there's a little something happens at the end that's an indicator of uh oh, this may happen again. And uh, my favorite example of that is the the film version of um, uh, the Silence of the Lambs. Mm. You remember where um, Hannibal Lecter calls Clarice and, and he's still there. And then he says, you know, I have to go now. I'm having an old friend for dinner. <laughs> yeah. And, you, you know, that's just a perfect uh-oh ending that could um, make uh, for, for a next, you know, the, the, the sequel. Yeah, and it's so you mentioned that, and I've just finished watching Stranger Things uh, series three. Do you watch Stranger Things on Netflix? No, I haven't seen that, but I've heard good things oh, about it. Fantastic! And of course, we're very lucky these days. We have amazing TV, amazing storytelling, and uh, in the book, you talk about the difference between climax and denouement. And Stranger Things season three, if anyone's going to watch it, it has a very good example of that, which is uh, you know three months later. Uh, yeah. and that and that the kind of rest and then they also have an uh-oh moment which I won't talk about but um so uh, can you uh, sort of go a bit more into the difference between because people often think ending is climax like big explosion whatever in a thriller yeah. um so what's the difference between climax and denouement well <clears throat> I think in using the literary terms the the climax is is the high the, the point of greatest conflict where uh, the the two battling sides come for that one final climactic battle, and then one of you know there's going to be a win or a loss, and then the denouement is sort of the aftermath of that. What are the consequences of that uh, final battle? I I I use in, in my books the term uh, final battle for climax, and then the proving the transformation as the denouement or the last thing we see. Um, in my view, the, the character, the lead character, is either going to be transformed in a fundamental way uh, in, the, in their own life, uh, what kind of human being they are, or <clears throat> the, uh, the other uh, side of it is if someone is a fundamentally decent person, like uh, Dr. Richard Kimball in The Fugitive, they're, they're not going to be transformed into another kind of person. They, they need to stay the same. But what Kimball does is by going through what he does, he becomes stronger. He has to find new resources. He has to uh, find a way to survive. And so at the end, you, you have a, a scene. I, I advocate having a scene that proves the transformation, that shows the new equilibrium or the new uh, character and that becomes then sort of the, the, the proof of everything that's come before it. And then the very last thing, and I talk about this in my book, is resonance, is the great final image, final line, whatever it is, that just seems so perfect for that book that you leave the reader going, ah, that's fantastic, and or uh-oh. But you, you give them... Uh, just I, I work on the final page of my books probably more than any other aspect to try to get just the right sound, because when that happens, uh, man, it just makes for an unforgettable reading experience. And, you know, that's what we try to deliver. And um, so I guess we've talked a lot about uh, genre fiction, which I feel has more tropes, I guess, around endings. Right. Um, and what about literary fiction? Because I guess that's got a lot to do with, with character transformation. But if a book is more literary uh, in, in, in nature, w what, what are your thoughts on endings there? Right. I, I talk about, in the book, I talk about sort of the, the five types of, of endings. Um, I talk about how the lead can win, the lead can lose, the lead can sacrifice, the lead can seemingly win, but really lose. The example I use there is the Godfather. You know, Michael Corleone, you know, wins the, the, the plot issue, the, the mafia war issue, but loses his soul. Um, now, and then I talk about open ended. Now, that's more in for the literary genre is where you're, you're leaving the the aftermath of the ending in the mind of the reader that they are uh, they are left to 
to contemplate what is the trajectory of this ending. You don't know. And with the genre fiction, as we spoke about, your readers want a certain satisfactory um, type of ending that isn't ambiguous. But a literary ending is more about, well, letting the reader participate in the final uh, contemplation of what's happened. <clears throat> the two examples I use, I use um, The Catcher in the Rye, which uh, is, is you know, the famous coming of age uh, str- adolescent struggle where it begins in a sanitarium and it ends in a sanitarium. And you really don't know if the narrator is going to ever get out or not commit suicide. Um, and that's again, left to the reader. And that's one example. The other example is uh, gone with the wind, right? I, I'll, I'll get Rhett back. I'll think about it. Tomorrow is another day, but uh, does she? <laughs> well, that was left open. And then, then for some odd reason, the, the estate gave permission to write a sequel to Gone with the Wind. And oh, but I no one knows he, about that. <laughs> they were not very happy. <clears throat> I, th- here's two, I have two rules. Don't write a sequel to Gone with the Wind and don't try to remake Casablanca. <laughs> Oh, that's great. And of course, I've seen um, uh, Robert McKee. I've been to his story uh, seminar. I'm sure uh, you know McKee. Um, I t- yeah, I took it back in the day as well. Yeah. And it, well, it's still exactly the same, right? He just performs the same thing over and over again. But he does that breakdown of Casablanca and it's, it is very, very good. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, just um, any other examples of bad or unsatisfying endings and anything we can learn? Well, yeah, uh, there's a couple of things that um, are common that people need to be aware of. Uh, And this is especially true for those so-called pantsers, as we (laughs) like to call those who write without any kind of outline or knowing what's going to happen. And I'm not I'm perfectly fine with that as long as you, you understand the challenges of that. And I also say to people who like to outline, you've got to know how to be organic as well. So it's uh, there's an art and a craft to it both ways. But you can write yourself into a corner and try to solve it with what's called deus ex machina, you know, God in the machine, where all of a sudden some big coincidence or something out of the blue happens to solve the main problem. Uh, I think. Uh, although I'm not specifically aware uh, of the book you mentioned earlier by Mr. King, I don't, I didn't read that, but that may have been what you're talking about. Is that there's some something big that happens that seems to come out of the blue? Yeah, that's basically uh, yeah. it. Oh, is it? Well, <laughs> from, I from just, a completely yeah. other genre that you go, what, what just happened? <laughs> well, that's another thing. Yeah, it, you know, I've, I've seen, I've read books. Um, that seem to be realistic, and then all of a sudden, in the middle, switch to some sort of uh, you know sci-fi universe, and that really annoys me because it's it's a it's a cheat. You're you're investing yourself into the realism of it, and then all of a sudden the rules change. So, but anyway, something that happens at the end that the the lead character, the protagonist, hasn't earned, hasn't in some way set up to have happen. Uh, If someone is going to come, let's say, to the rescue of the lead character who is in some seemingly impossible situation at the end, then that relationship needs to have been set up earlier and the protagonist needs to have participated in some way in his rescue. So having a coincidence happen at the end to get the lead character out of trouble is deus ex machina. Um, Another danger is when you have a comp, if you have a complicated plot (laughs) to have the talkative villain at the end. (laughs) Explain everything. (laughs) He explains everything while keeping the lead alive just long enough for the lead to figure out how to get, you know, get him or somebody else to break in and kill him. So, you know, the to, to solve that, you know, most villains 
are not going to sit there and yak at you. You've got to, <laughs> you, you've got to put that explanation either all the way at the end in some other character's mouth or drop in bits of information beforehand. Uh, the the um, example I talk about is uh, in Psycho. You, you know why? You know there's that shocking ending, and why? Why do we see that? Why was that there? And then it cuts to a scene where there's a, a psychiatrist explaining to the people who survived everything that that happened to make it so. And that that worked in that context because it was not too long, and it did allow for that shock uh, that comes at the end to happen. But you don't want to have the bad guy sitting there explaining everything. And then maybe one other thing is often there will be some little plot loose ends that need to be resolved. Um, you know, you finished you finished the novel, you finished the big plot point, and then all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, there was that accountant who disappeared uh, in Chapter 10. How do you how do you uh, resolve that? And one of the easiest ways to do that is to create a minor character to provide that information at the end. And then you can go back and plant that minor character earlier in the book so that the character doesn't just come out of the blue. Those are just a couple of the issues that I deal with in the book. Mm. And it, I think it's interesting because uh, it's like the explaining <sighs> everything idea is why I don't enjoy Agatha Christie type, uh, you know, books. And obviously things have moved on and, you know, coming back to Stranger Things, I mean, we just binged that in two nights and the sophistication of the story consuming audience now yeah. is so far beyond what it would have been back when, you know, Agatha Christie was, a, yeah. the, well, still, still a best-selling author, still amazing as well as people who love, still love Agatha Christie. But it's interesting because I think our expectations have changed as well. And, you know, even if people haven't read thousands of books, the tropes of these things come through in popular culture uh, mm. and they, they're almost laughing at it, which is why I, you know, Stranger Things is very good in so many ways. But the tropes that you were talking about there, um, they're almost laughing at some of them. And, and that in itself is quite clever. So, you, right. yeah, there are so many layers to this kind of ending um, idea, uh, which is fantastic. Okay, so uh, anything else on endings, or we're going to move on? Well, uh, I uh, I just simply advocate that that is um, that part of the book should get the attention that it deserves, and it should. I believe the best way to go about it is to know your ending before you get to it. Some people want to write all the way to the end and try to figure it out. I think that's too late. Now, if you're an outliner and you're used to saying, okay, I know what the outcome is going to be. For instance, if you're writing a thriller or a mystery and you know what the bad guy is doing and why he's doing it and the steps that he's taking, it makes it a little easier to drop in sort of red herrings or surprising twists that you wouldn't have thought about if you didn't know the ending. But at some point as you're writing, even if you're just kind of writing as discovery, I think understanding what that midpoint is, that mirror moment that I call it in Write Your Novel from the Middle, will then give you an idea of where the ending should go. And you can always change it when you get there. But having that idea, I think, empowers your writing and it avoids some of these things that we just talked about, like Deus Ex Machina. Um, it, it, it enables you to to be creative within the right parameters. So that's all I would say is just um, don't be afraid of giving the ending thought before you get there. Uh, it, it'll pay off for you. Mm. Okay, so... I wanted to talk to you about publishing things because you are a hybrid writer. You've been published by lots of traditional publishers, but many of your books are uh, indie as well. And you've been published by Writer's Digest for many of your books for writers. And as we speak, um, F&W Media, who owned that imprint, uh, went bankrupt. And those books have been acquired by Penguin Random House uh, or PRH. Now, I, I think it's, you know, you've been a lawyer, you understand intellectual property 
property rights. But many authors don't really understand what can happen to their rights once they license them to a publisher. So I wondered if you could talk a bit about this situation and what it means when, you know, you don't have any choice. You didn't have any choice who they went to. Turned out quite well. Um, But uh, maybe can you just talk a bit about that? Yeah, considering, well, when you contract with a publishing company, you're licensing the right to publish those books, your books, your intellectual property, and you have a contract. And in a situation like this, where the publishing company that you've got the contract with files for bankruptcy and then seeks to have a buyer take over their assets, your contract goes with it. Your contract goes into the bankruptcy system as an asset, and therefore it's being disposed of or um, transferred by a bankruptcy court. And in in this particular case, what happened is that those uh, of us who are Writers Digest authors there was uh, a halt in the uh, all of the um, royalties that were owing because that's how you do it in a bankruptcy. You know, you, everything is frozen, and then it's sorted out. Now, in this case, um, Peng- Penguin Random House, which happens to be the biggest publisher in the world and has the assets to d- to uh, make this go, uh, is going to take over this brand and these books, which have a great reputation and a great following. And so that sale has already been approved. And as we speak now, it's being finalized. The details are being worked out. And when the sale closes, um, Penguin Random House has indicated that they are going to continue the enterprise just as it was before and that they are going to pay the royalties that were pre-bankruptcy related and uh, move on. And that's, I think, the the best outcome that could have happened for Writer's Digest. Uh, in other cases, that may not be as uh, as good. There have been, you know, cases where a, a company goes bankrupt and there are no, there is no sale of the assets, and therefore royalties aren't paid, and the writers have to get their rights back, which is usually. Um, not contested when there's a bankruptcy and uh, a final dissolution. But uh, at some point, you know, there there may come a time when the, uh, if the publishing uh, a company ceases to publish the, the books that you've made a contract for, then you have the right to seek the reversion of rights. So it can get complicated. But I think in this case, the the indications are are good. And uh, hopefully by the time this prod this podcast is is uh, broadcast, we will have uh, better news. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I wanted to mention it uh, because I, you know, I've been in this industry now for over 10 years. And over the years, I, we've seen a lot of uh, different publishing houses either go bankrupt or just fold. I mean, sometimes just say, okay, we're done. We are stopping you know publishing and I know many authors who have struggled um with with this type of situation and obviously when you sign a contract there is a clause in the contract that says if the company goes bankrupt this is what will happen and I feel like so many authors well a might not read the contract in detail but may ignore that clause thinking that it's uncommon um but we've seen we've seen reasonable amounts of this right and buying and selling of publishing companies and imprints is quite normal business practice. Yes, we have. And uh, of course, in the last 10 years with the rise of digital publishing, there have been small companies and oftentimes an author who is publishing his or her own books and then decides, well, I'll publish other people's books as well and becomes an enterprise. But we've seen a number of those also go belly up and uh, then the, the author is usually the author is not going to get the royalties that they mm. had hoped, but at least they then have the book back and can publish it themselves. But of course that brings up, you know, the whole issue of authors who are wanting to go indie, having a certain uh, amount of business 
acumen or understanding, which you and I both teach. And I, I tell authors that, you know, it's not that complicated. There are certain fundamentals, but I find a lot of writers and creatives just kind of resist thinking that way. Don't you find that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I was going to come back to business with you because, um, and I noticed you have a new website as well, which is very um, swish. <laughs> well, I, it was about time. I had a kind of an old clunky one and uh, it was time to update it. So I did. Yeah, you did. And so I went, uh, I was poking around. I was like, oh, this is nice. And I noticed that you, uh, you do have multiple streams of income. Of course, you have the books, you have your teaching um, and you have a great book called How to Make a Living as a Writer. Um, and you, uh, you've also added Patreon, which I'm fascinated by. So can you tell us a bit about um, your different streams of income at the moment and how does Patreon fit in? Yeah, uh, well, I think, you know, for those like you and myself and others who are authorpreneurs, um, we have to think in multiple streams of income. Um, in the old days, pre-Kindle, you had one way to, to be published effectively, and that was to contract with a, a traditional publishing house, and you were kind of at the, the mercy of whatever forces were at work there. But now, with all of the things available to us, we just um, uh, multiple streams of income we're talking about. Uh, it, it's just a, a fantastic time to be able to do these various things. Now, I'm primarily think of myself as a writer who happens to teach. Um, so my focus is always on how can I write more fiction. So one of the things that has come, well, I'll mention too uh, the. Pa Patreon, as you, you, you spoke about, and you are also, you have a, a nice Patreon mm -hmm. presence for your podcast and so forth. Um, and I, I wasn't comfortable when I first learned about Patreon asking people to support me f monthly in writing fiction. I felt like, look, I do well writing fiction. I write something. I put it out there. They can buy it or not. But then I found out that Patreon also has a per creation model where uh, your patrons are charged only for when you put something out there as a creation for them to consume. And I thought, wow, this would be great if it could work for my shorter fiction because I love short stories. I love novellas and novelettes. And, uh, but the market for that outside um, the indie world is not, is not great. I mean, there, there are a few places, but, um, you know, the pay, the pay isn't that great. And, and, uh, it just the ROI, the return on investment. So I thought, wait, maybe I could do more of these shorter works of fiction, uh, for people who are fans of my work and uh and then also give them premiums for for higher pledges such as you know video chats and so on and so i did a lot of research i went to a a patreon presentation here in los angeles and asked a lot of questions and i launched it and it's been great um i i i'm writing short uh thriller fiction and mystery fiction and flash fiction and all of this and it's becoming a nice stream of income and it's so far it's worked very well and i i would encourage some of your listeners to check it out check out the patreon page for james scott bell yeah absolutely and i think uh there are some really good models i support a, a few creators on the per thing <laughs> model um and yeah i mean it, it i and i'm surprised myself over the years how how uh, patreon kind of grows like like everything you know you start out and it's tiny and you wonder whether it's worth it and then over the years uh, as yeah. more people hear about it also it's kind of gone mainstream now so uh, people are used to the model now also one of the other things you've just done is you have narrated write your novel from the middle in audio uh so i wondered it's your first one right that you've self-narrated that's that's right yeah so and tell us um what did you learn from that experience well it's been a long time coming and people kept asking me when's this coming out on audio when's it coming out on audio i have done a, a couple of books a couple of my books through acx which is the uh amazon slash audible uh self-publishing platform for audiobooks 
uh, with a narrator where I've contracted with a narrator and done a, a share of the profits and so on, which is uh, a perfectly legitimate way to go. But having, you know, people said, you know, look, you used to be an actor. You used to do commercials. Why don't you narrate your own books? And for a long time, it was just a matter of me thinking, oh, gosh, when am I going to find the time to do that? I'm writing this and I'm writing that and I'm teaching. And then one day I just said, you know, I've got to give this a try. And so I did some research. I figured out uh, how to set up a little mini studio and um, I had the software and I said, OK, I'm going to give it a try. And I started with write your novel from the middle, which is not a long book. And it would be a good experiment for me. And so I followed the process. It took me about a week to narrate the whole thing. And then I, you know, I prepared the materials that go with it and I published it to ACX. It takes a couple of weeks for them to check the quality and it went through. And so I'm, I'm pleased uh, as punch about that because I've got a lot of these books I can put on audio now and I know that it works. And there's another stream of income because it's just you have an asset sitting there that that's been selling well uh, as a book and you just turn it into an audio. That's another stream of income. Absolutely. And uh, and just back on the IP rights there. So is that an indie book or did you keep the audio rights from uh, Writer's Digest? Uh, no, that is an, an indie book. And but that's a good uh, point is that when you you're if you're going to negotiate a contract um, for traditional public publication, you might want to consider if you're able to to reserve the audio rights. Uh, that's a, a a good matter for negotiation. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I love that you said just uh, go and do some research and give it a try. And I feel <laughs> like that you've you've done that over and over again in your career. And, uh, you know, you do so much. And I really want people to go check out your website and check out everything you do online. So tell us where that is. You can go to jamesscottbell.com. And that will give you a hub for everything that I do from my video online teaching to the books to my appearances and so forth. And even a, I offer a free book for people who want to sign up for my email updates. So it's all there at jamesscottbell.com. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Jim. That was great. Well, it's always great to chat with you, Joanna. And uh, you are doing so much for uh, authors and authorpreneurs, and um, we all think it's marvelous. So thanks a lot. So I hope you found the interview with Jim useful today and that it's given you some ideas for your own endings if you write fiction or for multiple streams of income regardless of what you write. So next week we are back on mindset and I'll be talking about trusting your creativity and choosing yourself with Jen Loudon. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.